Now this is HIV of the mouth. Uh, it's kind of a candida infection that takes place in crustacean on the lips right here. Uh, this is a fairly common problem uh, that takes place when a person's immune system is compromised. And you know, it's, there are simple uh, things you can do that would neutralize this staph or candida that is growing in the mouth. Today we know that this is correct. And every advance in natural hygiene has emphasized this truth more and more fully. But in Ellen White Day, it was such a revolutionary idea that it met with violent opposition on all sides. And particularly, of course, by the orthodox medical profession, as indeed it does today. In other words, they had problems with Ellen White concept of uh, disease. Because she, I got my concept from her, that disease is a friend and not an enemy. <clears throat> Y'all are aware, aware of that. Listen to what Ellen White said. Impurities of the body, that's toxin. That's sluggish bowels, that's arthritis. That's high glucose, which is diabetes. That is free radicals that can cause cancer. That's anything of a surplus amount in the body that become toxic to the system. Irregardless, if it's too much protein, it can compromise the function of the kidneys. If it's too high potassium, it can burn out the kidneys. So anything, do you know that when you eat too much protein, nuts, seeds, any type of protein, that that protein, if it's not digested properly, it can be released into your blood undigested. If that protein get under your skin, undigested products of the protein get under your skin, you can develop a condition called hives. Have you ever heard of hives? A urica. Hives make you break out and itch like crazy. That's because an undigested protein got up under the skin and it irritated the skin and broke out the skin. Now the skin broke out because it's trying to get it out. The skin is the largest eliminatory organ we have. And so many of our conditions that we develop is manifested on the skin because the skin is trying to cast it out. Do you know if you eat cheese, uh, eggs, uh, dairy products too much, and some of that dairy products is not digested, but it's circulated in the bloodstream and it end up in your bronchial tube, in your lungs, you can end up with bronchitis or asthma. Because you have a predigested protein, or well, undigested protein uh, in the system where it should not be. And that undigested protein will cause uh, a toxic reaction. It's kind of like a snake, uh, a, a poisonous spider bite. You can eat a black widow spider, a brown lacoose. You can eat it with the poison in it. As long as you don't have a crack in your mouth, it won't necessarily bother you. You can eat a rattlesnake with the venom in it. As long as you don't have a crack in your stomach and your mouth, it ain't no problem. Because the hydrochloric acid in your stomach is there for the sole purpose to do what? Break down protein. And all the venom is, is protein. That's all. <clears throat> People say, well, I'm, I'm scared to death of a rattlesnake because he bites you to kill you. Do you know you can take soy milk and put it in a syringe and shoot it under your skin and it can kill you just as fast as a venom? You can take pork juice, uh, chicken juice, and shoot it under your skin and it'll give you a toxic reaction and could kill you. It's an offensive protein. Going where it should not be. There's no mechanism under your skin or in your blood to break these proteins down. And it can cause a very severe reaction. So we should be just as afraid of undigested protein coming in our system as any other toxic uh, spider or snake. They both can cause problems. The impurities of the body, if not allowed to escape, are taken back into the blood and forced upon internal organs that mean all this toxin that's circulating, nature, that's the body, to relieve herself of the poisonous impurities, that's the stuff we're eating and put in our system, make an effort to free the system. So that means your body now will make an effort to what? Get rid of it. This effort produced fever. 
Okay, so now your body is trying to get rid of the toxic debris in the body. Once it tries to get rid of it, it produces a fever. So the fever is a byproduct of your body trying to get rid of the waste in the system. That makes a fever a friend and not an enemy. So when a person come down with a high fever, a child come down with a high fever, what is the most natural thing we do? Stop the fever, don't we? But in actuality, the fever is a friend. Do you treat a friend like that? Do you dump a friend in, a friend in ice cold water? No. You wouldn't do that to a friend. So the process we running now, we have a total now delivery. The, say it again, bro. The process of medicine is in that. Like how we it's in this that's right. We follow that same system. Because when a person have a fever, we what? Cool them down. We try to stop the fever. And that prolongs the condition. Now, when you get a fever, your body's what? Heating up, right? What is the purpose of the fever? To heat up the system to produce an immune reaction. We give fever baths for cancer patients. Overheated baths to increase their immune system to fight an infection in the body but when they get a cold and get a fever we give them a cold bath. We are really Babylonian in our mind. It don't make sense. So now what we instead of giving them a ice bath we could give them a temperate bath or we can give them a warm bath. Now what that will do is that will not stop the fever it will bring the fever down in a safe level. And we will monitor that fever and keep it in a safe level until the fever will eventually burn out. The immune system will do its job and kill whatever it is that's bringing infection. A child, these little children in here, they can run 102, 103 fever. And boy, it scares half to death. We run all over the place. Man, this child burning up, 102, 103. And they run around playing they ain't bother with it. You get 101, you wiped out. You wiped out. You sick as a dog. But their heart rate is much faster. Their metabolism is faster. Their circulatory system is faster. They can handle 102, 103. You cannot. So don't panic. Bring that fever back down to 99, 100, 101, and just keep it around that area. Every once in a while, sponge them down with a temperate bath, a little apple cider vinegar, sponge them down with it, give them a cool enema, and just keep it around 100, 101 for a couple of days. The fever will burn out and the child will be well and no problem at all. But if you dip them in ice water, oh, you're going to knock the fever out, but you stop the process, the curative process. And so eventually, they're going to come up with runny nose and sniffles. You ever seen a child I always got the sniffles and runny nose? Because they are killing the fever. Let the fever do its job and it won't keep coming back like that. Instead of doing this and seeking to remove the poisonous matter from the system, they take a more deadly poison into the system to remove a poison already there. <clears throat> so in other words, uh, they're saturated with poison and toxins in the system. Then they go and get drugs to try to what? neutralize the poison. You know what that, that science is? Home, homeopathy. Homeopathy is a new age concept where like kind cures like kind. All right? Like. Like kind cures like kind. Poison cures poison. That's what they have in a caduceus. You know what the caduceus is, right? That's the snake wrapped around the tree. The snake is wrapped around a dead, dead tree. And the dead snake is biting a dead tree and that's supposed to produce life. That's the whole principle behind allopathic medicine. And natural homeopathy follows that same thing. If you get sick, they find out whatever toxin made you sick, they dilute it down 1,000 per million and give it to you in homeopathy form and they say that would cure you too. That is not the way it do, it do it. That is not how you treat disease. 
Nature will bear the abuse as long as she can without resisting. Then she will arouse and make a mighty effort to rid herself of encumbrance and evil treatment she has suffered. So the body going to what? Stand up and say, I'm tired of you abusing me. Then come headaches and chills and fever and nervousness. All this come as results of the body what? Saying, I'm sick of you uh, eating all this bad stuff. Now I'm going to make an effort to cure myself myself. And now you see all these symptoms, too numerous to mention. And it's because nature is trying to help itself. A wrong course of eating and drinking destroys health and with it the sweetness of life. So not by smothering the symptoms, but by removing the cause of these symptoms, when they themselves would naturally and automatically disappear. What is the, what is the cause? Waste. Poisonous material in the system, which nature is endeavoring to expel. <clears throat> so nature automatically will try to expel the waste out of the system. It would always do that. And we must learn to recognize nature in her cleansing process and learn to help nature do her job effectively. Today this condition is known among health reformers as toxemia. By this they do not mean germs or the excretion of germs, but a general condition of poisoning brought on by an excess of putrefying waste matter in the bloodstream and body generally. The, under normal condition, a person should have two bowel movements a day. Under normal condition. Under optimal condition, a person would have three bowel movements a day. That's optimal. That's better than normal. But the average person averages about one bowel movement a day. And that's the average so-called healthy eating person. Most people have one good bowel movement in the morning. And the reason why you have a good bowel movement in the morning because you lay in the bed and your intestinal tract is laying dormant and everything, your organs slow down and now when you wake up, you get up, and by getting up, you arouse your peristalsis, and that's arousing your peristalsis makes you want to go to the toilet. And then, once you go to the toilet and release, relieve yourself, you come back and you sit down at the table, you should, those that eat breakfast in the morning, you sit down and you begin to eat your breakfast in the morning, all of a sudden you get another urge to go to the toilet. That is the second movement of the day. And that is perfectly normal. How can we determine what is normal and what is not? Well the only acid test we have is a baby, an infant. A baby. Because there's hardly no humans that we can use as a scale to go by. But an infant that has been breastfed and the mother's taking care of her health, every time that child feeds, it's going to have a movement. Have you noticed that? Yes. If the um, head of the spouse's movement is weak, is not, um, like the person only has, uh, goes only once a day or once a day, that means the head of the spouse's movement is weak. What caused that? Is it the, the enzymes? Is it not enough enzymes in the body? Well, <clears throat> I mean, a lot, it's come from many different reasons why a person's peristalsis become weak to the point they become paralyzed. You can have a paralyzed bowels. Uh, one is not enough fiber, not enough roughage, not drinking enough water, not getting enough exercise. Uh, the other is overstressed. That too can cause that. A mineral to vitamin deficiency can cause it. So there are many reasons why that can happen. When this is expelled, all symptoms, that is, all the so-called disease spontaneously vanish, the patient is cured. And that's by simply attending to the cleansing process. And I tell you, if you can learn how to detox, and we should learn how to detox the liver, the kidney, the colon, the blood, bloodstream, the, uh, uh, the full, all the whole eliminary canals, we should learn how to totally detoxify the system. 
And if you don't do nothing else, you will cure most of your patients that you're working with. You don't have to learn all the herbs and all the vitamins and all of that. Just learning how to thoroughly detox a person can go a long ways. The true art of healing is thus very simple. All so-called diseases are basically one. In other words, they are one disease. Not many. There's only one disease. And the Bible makes it plain. And that's a blood disease. We, we're aware of that, right? The life of the flesh is where? Blood. In the blood. So that means the quality of life is in the blood. If you got bad blood, you got bad quality of life. So we don't have to worry about what is arthritis and what is diabetes and what is brain cancer and what is melanoma and all that. It is very complicated learning all that stuff. Learn first that there's only one disease. There's only one cure for sin and that's the blood of Christ. There's only one cure for disease and that's cleansing the blood. So if we cleanse and detoxify the blood, you're going to rid yourself of most problems. All so-called diseases are basically one. There are not many diseases, but one causative factor, which may produce local symptoms. Now there may be many different symptoms. <clears throat> you got a symptoms of arthritis, you got symptoms of diabetes, you got symptoms of cancer, you got symptoms of a backache. But they all come to one fundamental causative factor, and that's toxemia, a toxin. So by simply eliminating the toxic debris, we can cover all the symptoms of, of the so-called diseases. The same cause is that fact. That means the same toxic buildup in the system and the same method of treatment can be applied. So by simply thoroughly detoxifying the system. You take medicine with Parkinson disease. <coughs> Parkinson disease is a central nervous system disease. It causes shaking and stiffness and memory loss. Possible causes are as heavy and toxic metal, poor diet, stress, and not enough rest. I had an opportunity to work with this man with severe Parkinson. And what I'm doing here is these are just these are little children exercise, little games. We played patty cake, we played catch the ball, and we played marching. Because he couldn't walk. So what I would do, I'd get in front of him and we'd play marching. And we'd do this here. And then we'll play patty cake. Play patty cake. Then we'll throw balls. What I'm doing is I'm training his mind to function. He has lost the ability to respond to his sensory and motory nerves. And so when he get ready to pick up this book, he's doing this here. He's shaking like this here. He'd have a hard time picking his book up like this. So what I did is I said, pick the book up. I grab his hand and I put it on the book and I help him grab the book and I said, put the book down. He put it down. You know, I may do that for three weeks or a month, every day, 30 or 40 minutes a day, every day. I come back, I said, pick the book up and I help him, he set it down. After a couple of weeks of doing that, then I simply grab his hand and I don't help him. I said, pick the book up. And he grabbed the book and he picked it up. Then eventually, I said, pick the book up. I put my finger on him. I said, pick the book up. And he lift the book up. Then eventually, like I said, pick the book up. And he would pick it up. And it's because his motory and sensory nerves now are reconnecting. You do that with stroke patients, you do that with quadriplegic, people that are paralyzed, you have to incorporate your brain with them. Because they have lost that function. They have lost the function of their sensory nerves and their motor nerves working together. But you still have your sensory nerve and your motor nerves. You have to help them regain that. Your body will regrow those nerves. But you have to be patient and wait. See what I'm doing here? I'm teaching them how to walk. That's what I'm doing. I'm teaching them how to walk. You work with a stroke patient, they can't walk. A person in a wheelchair, you teach them how to walk sitting down. Now eventually, I will stand him up. 
put his hand on the back of a chair and he would do the same thing. And eventually I would lead him and let him walk. But I must begin right here. Because the principle of the Bible is, is so as the man thinketh, so is he. I have to convince him that he can walk. If I can convince him he can walk, he will walk. And it's because the mind will do it. And he will, as long as he's got a mind to fight, he will eventually figure out how to do it. And so, but be patient. Because it may take a lot of time. Now I'm teaching them how to stand. And I don't know how long, how many days I did this. But all this is teaching them proper coordination. Uh, and he's learning. His body, his brain now is working in harmony. Now I'm going to teach him how to walk. Now keep in mind, he has severe Parkinson. And when you tell him to do something, it, it, it computes real slow. See the stiff gait that he has? Now he's going to get around this chair and then his brain just going to freeze up a little bit. And see how he's had to slowly go around that? And his brain just kind of froze a little bit. But you work with him until it kicked back in. You see how long it took him to go around that chair? But you keep doing it. Don't give up on people. Stay with them. And eventually they will come it. Now also I give them L-DOPA. I'm not dealing with treatments in this session. But I do give them L-DOPA in the form of, well L-DOPA is in fava beans. Fava beans. And um, the fava beans and bananas are very high in dopamine. Doctors give L-DOPA to Parkinson patients. We give dopamine found in fava beans and bananas to Parkinson patients. And then we put them on some B vitamins and we clean them and detoxify them. And in time, they can overcome their problem. Here's another one here with gout. Uh, I mean a gorda, I'm sorry, a gorda. Now you can see the, the left and the right lobe of the thyroid is extremely large. Uh, you'll find a lot of this in countries where people don't eat a lot of fresh uh, vegetables. I was in Asia and I noticed a lot of the, in Malaysia, and I, I was in a large group, about 50 people in a class, and I checked all, everybody's thyroid and over half of the people had gorders. And the re reason why a lot of Asians have it is Asians, they believe in stir frying or cooking their vegetables. They don't eat a raw salad, you know, like we do. All their vegetables are either stir fried or cooked. And they, in doing that, they're destroying the iodine, the iodine. Chinese is uh, bad in it because Chinese people, they believe in the yin and the yang. And they believe that if they eat it raw, that it's, it's not healthy. They believe if you cook it, you actually make it healthier. And so, but they're pulling out the iodine. So when you see a person with a thyroid condition, as you see right here, that person's thyroid gland is about the size of a walnut, but now it is huge. It can really get large. It will swell real large because the brain is saying, if I can make the thyroid gland larger, then it can house more iodine and then I get well. So it caused the thyroid to swell in hope of that we will assist the body by eating more iodine food and it can bring in more iodine and correct the problem. But we don't change our dietary habits so the gorda just get larger and larger. But all they need is really iodine, an amino acid called tyrosine. By taking iodine, and don't even worry about this treatment right now because we will go back over it when we're dealing with treatments and then we'll go over the amounts and why we use iodine and tyrosine to reduce uh, thyroid problems. This is a condition called maxedema, yes. <clears throat> Uh, what about those the uh, thyroid is uh, warmed by the doctors, you know, really removed? 
Well, if they take radioactive iodine, there's nothing you can do if they burn out the thyroid gland. You know, the thyroid is dead, it's gone, it's burnt out. There's nothing you can do on that. But just tell them to eat healthy and take their thyroid medication the rest of their life. Uh, some people, they take a small amount of radioactive iodine and they leave a little piece of their thyroid. If they leave a little piece of their thyroid, then that person can recover. You can work them off of their radio, I mean off of their medication. Uh, but if it's totally burnt out, there's nothing you can do for them. Okay, now this is a max, maxedema. Uh, and when I was a kid, there used to be a, 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 a TV character, y'all probably don't know it, it used to be called Mr. Magoo. And Mr. Magoo, they all look like this. I mean, everyone that have this condition looked just like this. They had a big bag of eyes and a puffy face. And, um, and they all look like that because there is a problem with the antidiuretic hormone. You have what we call diuretic hormones, which cause you to urinate and to expel fluid out of the body. And you have what you call antidiuretic hormones that stop you from throwing off so much fluid. These people have a problem with that diuretic hormone. And the antidiuretic hormone is preventing the fluid from being cast out. So they are building up fluids in the body. So when you see somebody with puffy eyes, and they get up in the morning, their eyes are puffy. And you say, well, why are the eyes puffy in the morning? Because at night, when you're sleeping, your antidiuretic hormones uh, take over to preserve your fluid level while you're sleeping. But when you wake up and you get up, your diuretic hormones kick in and tell the antidiuretic hormones to get out the way. And now you have to go to the bathroom, you have to urinate, you have to move around, and then the puffiness go down. And it's because of the antidiuretic hormones and the diuretic hormones. If you see somebody with puffy eyes, and it's like that all the time, they probably got a problem with their kidneys. Uh, they probably got some kind of problem with fluid retention, especially if there's darkness under the eyes. Now, take a look at this young child's hand right here. What do you see in this child's hand? Hmm? Shortening. A shortening? Shrinking? Okay, you see the line, right? How many lines do you see? One. Take a look at your hand. If you got one, you won't know the difference anyway because you'd be mentally impaired. <laughs> okay. So, if you got one line, you are Down syndrome, are severely mentally retarded. Okay? So, uh, this is how they, when they look at newborn babies, they check the bottom of their feet and they check their hands. And if they got one line, they are Down syndrome, okay? And this is once again learning to see, learning to use your eyes. This is old techniques that the old country doctors used to use all the time before they had x-ray machines and all the technology. The doctors was trained to ascertain problems, but they got away from that, that science. And you see someone with, you can't hardly see that, but <clears throat> they got these little cluster of bumps right here on the lip there. That's herpes. Herpes. Okay, that's herpes. And this is lupus, in a severe case of lupus. Uh, and it's a really severe outbreak of lupus. Uh, there's principally two types of lupus. One that will affect your inner organs, your kidneys, and so on. And another type of lupus affects the skin. And it is a very uh, uncomfortable condition, especially when, you know, it affects the skin. This is a cancerous mole right here. And so you can spot them. Uh, Sometimes they're not black, as you see here. They're just dark. And, uh, they, you know, and you can tell right off they're real dark. And many times they're round. And uh, you know you can tell it had no business being there. That's probably a cancerous mold. I do advise that when you work with people who got molds, 
uh, don't be in a haste to try to remove those moles because moles are very dangerous they are they can be very vicious uh, you can remove this mold but I would not touch this mold unless I knew without a shadow of a doubt that it was cancerous and it was causing problems because if it's not you can mess with it and it could become cancerous and here's another uh, skin cancer right up here above the eye area that's the skin cancer on the nose right there and you know with a just a glance you might think well that's just a bump a blackhead but you got to learn to be able to distinguish the difference that's herpes of the finger right there so if someone shake your hand and got herpes of the fingers of the hand and if you don't you know disinfect your hand you could have herpes herpes is very easy to catch AIDS it's hard it's hard to catch AIDS but herpes is really easy when you use public toilets you know don't because you don't see it on this toilet stool don't mean it's not there I mean if somebody wet on a toilet stool and you sat on it you could get herpes and then you take it back and give it to your family so this is why you know never let your children go to public toilets and just sit don't do that because it's dangerous This is a, uh, now, uh, you can tell a lot by your fingernails. I mean, a lot. Uh, this is what we call uh, nail lifting disease. And the nails are actually bebbling up. They're actually bebbing up. And they become kind of a, a light, real lightish, pale, uh, yellowish looking color. And the nails raise up off of the bed of the finger. And uh, that's usually because yeast get up under the nails. And it grow under the nails and it's destroying the fingernail. And you can spot that real fast. This is a fungal infection of the nails right here. A fungal infection. This is a, a, a def, uh, mineral and vitamin deficiency. Uh, and I'll show you a better one. Yes. So if your nails are it's possibly that he have, he's lacking some oxygen in his blood. Uh, you, you know, he, he <clears throat> usually if the nails are purple, check his lips. If his lips are dark uh, and kind of a purpose around the lips, then he's lacking oxygen in his blood. And that could be serious, you know, either he could be low in iron, he could be a severe anemic, all of that, you know, is part of, you have to do an assessment, find out if he's tired most of the time, do he have a lot of energy. Uh, these things could be a sign of a severe anemic, a low oxygen level in the blood. How does he get back into How do you get back? I really don't want to deal with treatments right now because if I get into treatments it's gonna and I've really been going quite a long time I don't want to talk about treatments I, I will talk about it because we're gonna learn how to treat these diseases but I don't want to spend time on it this one here is um, when you notice your nails you see these ridges these lines that's a deficiency in iron and zinc yes it depends on how severe it is oh, so it, can get to a it, it can really get real severe uh, or it can be just slightly and this is another one of herpes of the lip right here I'm just going to go through these uh, real brief I want you to be able to spot herpes because uh, and there's a treatment for it. We can treat herpes. A lot of people have it. It's the, it is the number one fastest growing condition it is because, you know, young people are just spreading it like crazy. Uh, but, you know, it'd be good to be able to recognize it so that you can have your precaution up. This is yeast infection of the male penis. Okay, this is the male penis. Now, y'all doctors in here, right? Okay, so don't get squeamish on me. <laughs> okay. But this is the male penis right here. 
And uh, once you, if they've been circumcised, you can just look at it. It's got a red discoloration uh, around the head of the penis. And it looks somewhat inflamed with some little raised bumps. And that's yeast uh, uh, of the male penis. This is uh, psoriasis, and a severe form of psoriasis. Uh, and these hard, scaly patches can break out anywhere in the body. The most usual places is the elbows and the knees, but it can spread anywhere in the body. Anytime you have psoriasis like this, it's a problem with the liver, the liver and the bowels. And uh, the, the liver is designed to emulsify fats. And if the body's not breaking those fats down to fatty acids, then those fats become very uh, concentrated and it overburden the liver. And the, the brain will speed up cellular growth. Skin cells begin to grow and they develop scaly patches all over the body. This is an, uh, probably a typical way that you would notice psoriasis. If you notice that your elbows tends to be real dry, uh, and you may not have psoriasis at that time, but you, your liver may need to go on a liver cleanse, liver detox. If you notice your knees and your elbows stay a little ashy, go on a good uh, liver detox. And we're gonna learn how to do a liver detox. <clears throat> you see some people, have these little round circle patches on their face and on their body. That's ringworm. That's a parasite. And you can tell ringworm because it's a raised area around the edge. Uh, and that's because there's a parasite in there. Most of the time you're going to get parasites from animals. Especially your children. They love pets. They love dogs and cats and and you name it and they love to kiss on them and hug them and and this is where you get from uh, walking bath feet I, I, I spent a lot of time in Asian countries and the custom is you know you always take your shoes off and everybody walk around barefooted and they just spreading their stuff to everybody and I never do that I mean you take if if the custom is to, you put on some sandals or something but don't ever practice a custom of taking your shoes off in a public setting where a lot of people is. You don't know if they got athletic feet. You don't know if they got ringworms. You don't know what they have. But the minute you walk around, you're picking it up. And never walk outside barefooted. The animals are dropping. The rabbits and the squirrels and whatever animals you got, that's their toilet out there. And then when they drop, then you come along and walk behind them, you picking up their parasites. And I'm going to do a program on parasites. And I tell you, it's a tough one to witness, to see the amount, and amount of worms and you can have in your body and be able to live and function with all that in you. All morbid action are evidence of a remedial effort of nature to overcome the morbid condition or expel the morbid material. All that any true system of medication can do or should do, or should attempt to do, is to place the organism under the best possible circumstance for the favorable operation of those efforts. Now I'm going to get ready to stop this program. And I think I just want to show, and we're going to break, uh, but I want to show you a few clips. I think I have it in this program. Now, once again, this is candida right here. This is candida of the mouth. Uh, now, it's also called thrush. Thrush. Now, a lot of babies, when they're born, some of them have thrush. You know, they have the little white patches in the mouth. And that's because their immune system hadn't fully developed yet. Okay? And, uh... Now, God instructed the Israelites to circumcise the male babies on what day? Eighth. Eighth. eighth day. Do you know the reason why it was the eighth day? 
and the immune system is at its optimal level on the eighth day. See, when that child come out of the mother's womb, he's still living off the mother's immune system. But in about the eighth day, his immune system has developed and now he's living at the highest level that his immune system would be throughout the rest of his life. And so, when they circumcised that child on the eighth day, they never got an infection. In some of the most primitive environment, they never did because the immune system was so high. But today, a lot of children are born with candida, a thrust. A lot of AIDS patients have it also. Now here is candida <clears throat> right here. You see this little white spots on the tongue. Uh, and it can go all in the roof of the mouth, down the throat, and it can be, it can be very uh, painful, inflammation. I worked with AIDS patients that had the whole throat inflamed uh, with these white patches, and they couldn't eat. And you had to feed them through the rectum because they couldn't take no nourishment down because it was so inflamed. This would be one of the most difficult conditions to treat right here, ascites. I mean, it is really tough. And ascites is where, this is the person's stomach right here. And it has fluid in it. And the fluid is built up around the peritoneal cavity. There's your stomach lining has different layers. The fluid can actually get between the layers of tissue. And it is a major problem. When a person gets this problem, they are dying. When you see them uh, in their stomach, they're wasting away. They have bag of bones, but their stomach is the largest thing left. That person is very close to death because cetus is very hard to deal with. Uh, in this particular case, is the, uh, the nasal spectrum uh, is, is right here. This is the nasal spectrum right here and in here. This whole area right in here. Now if you notice the difference here, this uh, nose right here, spectrum is different. This one is wider here, across here. And you can see it's extended right up here in the roof of the nose. This one you don't have that. <clears throat> A lot of your uh, sleep apnea, uh, snoring, is, this is the cause of that. So if you're snoring real hard, I uh, have sleep apnea, it is because this uh, portion of the nose here is crooked, or uh, it's enlarged. And um, they have really wonderful treatments now that can get you over this. They can put a little clamp on your nose that actually tighten this spectrum up just a little bit and it open the air passage where you can breathe without, uh, you know, snoring. But this, once again, when you look at a person, you look. You look at the wean of their nose. Uh, you take, for instance, um, and I'm going to exaggerate this a little bit. Okay, let's just say that's a person's nose right there. And, but the wean of the nose is extremely large and open. And I'll just do this here. Okay, I'll just do that. You know, this is the mouth that's open. The wing of the nose are extremely large, open. When you see this, what do you notice when you see a person with their wing or their nose is extremely large? It shouldn't be that open. Their nose shouldn't be wide open like that. Have you ever noticed anyone with the wing of their nose open, real wide, where you can actually look down inside of the nose? Yes, we all have. When that happens is most of the time their mouth will stay open most of the time too. That means their nose, the wing of the nose is open and their mouth stay open. And the reason is they're having a problem with oxygen. 
they are trying to breathe in oxygen and so constantly doing that it caused the wing of the nose to expand. Now uh, another thing is this here. Okay, now the other thing is a person should have hair in their nose. When dust, ragweed, and pollen is in the air, it's, it's brought up into the nose area, wing of the nose. <clears throat> Once it hit, these are the hair shafts right here. Once it hit, that dust, ragweed, and pollen should cling to the hair shaft. When that happens, it triggers a mechanism in the brain. The brain then trigger, triggers the sense of sneezing, which casts it back out. All right? Now that is a natural process. If you notice a person do not have hair in the nose, that person is going to have respiratory problems. Asthma, bronchitis, allergies, they're going to have it. Okay? And it's because that everything they're breathing is coming right into the sinus area and causing problems. So you watch the, watch the wing of those nose and see if it's wide open. And if it is, that can let you, uh, give you a key that they were possibly going to have some respiratory problems. Now, what do you see different about this young man right here? Crooked nose, right. And like I said, I'm exaggerating it because I want you to... See, these are things you must pick up in your everyday uh, socialization with people. See what is, you know, kind of crooked or out of sync. This is keloids. And keloids is nothing but uh, acceler accelerated scar tissue growing real fast. It used to be that principally black people had problem with keloid because of our African connection because we practiced body piercing in Africa and some of our ancestors developed infections from body piercing and they developed genetic weakness toward keloid and so for many years they associated keloid as just a black person's or African problem. But today all races are having keloids because everybody's practicing body piercing now. Uh, and this is a girl I worked in uh, Nairobi. Uh, she had keloids all over her body, roped all around her body. And I removed all these keloids from off of her. It was all around her breast, all in her chest, her back, her neck. And I removed those keloids. Very painful experience. Uh, and I will go through how you can remove uh, keloids. <clears throat> also, I'm going to do a class on herbal surgery. I, I will show you what I do in, with herbal surgery and some other different techniques that you can learn. I, and I don't I'm not asking that you try to do everything that I will do. I have counted the, the consequences of what I do. You may not be there yet. Uh, but if you feel that you really want to go that, to that extent, then I'm more than happy to help you. But it is a risk if you try to take on some of the things that I do. There's some legal possibilities. In other words, you can get locked up. Okay, so, so just be mindful. You don't have to do everything that I'm advocating to be a successful medical missionary. Okay, now take a look at this woman. What do you see? Okay, what, what I, just tell me some of the things that you see. The what? Okay, anything else? The what? Okay, the eyes. Anything else? 
Okay, now tell me what you see with the neck. Okay, do you normally see a woman with a thick neck? Now, think of the animal kingdom. What animal that you can see always have a, a thick neck? A what? A bull and what else? A horse, a stud, right? If he's a stud, a stud gonna have a thick neck. And the farmers in here. Okay, now there's one in the back. Now if he's a gillin, he gonna look just like a filly. That means you done castrated him. You can't tell the difference from, him, from a uh, female horse. But if you don't castrate him, he's gonna look totally different. You can take twin horses, tw two twin studs. You can gill one of them and leave the other one in stud and they won't look nothing alike. The stud gonna end up with a big broad neck. The gilding gonna look like a female. The gilding, the one you castrate, is gonna be gentle and you can let the children walk under him and ride him. That stud, you can't trust him under no circumstance. All right? Now, what makes the difference between a stud that's been castrated and a stud that is in stud? The testosterone. The testosterone. Have you seen some of our athletes? Some of those athletes got big, thick necks because their testosterone level is really elevated. And so this woman, she has no business with a neck this thick. Her testosterone level is the same level of a man. What else do you see about this woman? What, what do you see with her breasts? He see it. This, this brother, he's got a quick eyesight. Her breast is what? You see? Well, it's, it, it, it's really, it's like a man's chest. You know, a woman's breast is closer together. Hers is expended out, and her breast, her chest is real broad. Her shoulders is broad, right? Like a man. What else do you see? Her legs. Her legs and her hips. And I covered it up, but this is a, she can go either way. She has both organs, both male and female organs. Okay, she has both male and female organs. And that is real. Don't you think that that's fiction? And so she really, uh, today what they're doing now with a lot of the children, they are converting them to whatever the parents want them at birth. If you wanted to be a boy, they'll make a boy out of it. If you wanted a girl, they'll make a girl out of it. Uh, so, but some of them have grown up and still have both uh, female and male parts. Yes? Are they, are they uh, predominantly one or the other? Well, it depends. It depends on what hormone is dominant. Uh, most of them uh, is, is bisexual. They can go either way. You know, most of them, 50-50, they're, they're, they're not a girl that has the male part on it, or they're not a boy that has the female part on No, they you look, go either way, they can go either way, uh, they can either be a male or they can be a female, they can choose which way, way they want to go, because they, they have an attraction both ways, okay? Okay, let's, let us stop right there. We're going to stop and let us break. <clears throat> and then we'll, uh, y'all let me know when it's time to come back. But we're going to stop right there. So basically what I want to do in this class is just kind of get you in the, in the sink of just using your eyes and just observing. Observe things that you normally don't observe and that'll help you when you're doing assessments and working with people.